Okay, so in this video, we're going to take an in-depth look at the background extraction function within Cyril. Background extraction is what will remove the gradients from our images caused by light pollution. Light pollution from a nearby city, light pollution from your neighbor's light, or the light that comes from the moon can also cause these gradients in our images. We're also going to touch real quick in the beginning and talk about the Bordel scale, the light pollution scale, how it rates, how you can determine what your Bordel class scale is, where you live or where you shoot at during your imaging sessions. My name is Rich, and you're watching Deep Space Astro. So we'll start real quick talking about the Bordel scale. The Bordel scale is something that was invented by a guy named John Bordel and it was published in Sky and Telescope back in 2001. Through his 50 years of nighttime observing, he put together this scale as a way to measure the amount of light pollution that's being generated by the cities and towns that we live in. I'll leave a link for this website in the description, lightpollutionmap.info. When you load it up, if you come over here and just click on your go to location button, it'll take you to your location. For obvious reasons, I'm not going to click that right now. We'll just zoom in here and um, show you how to use it real quick. This is just so if you want to determine what your Bordel scale is, or maybe you're planning on taking a trip and you, you're curious what the Bordel scale is at that place, or you want to plan your trip to be in the darkest location possible. So we're going to pick on Chicago here. And if I just click right on the whiter area, a little box is going to pop up and it's going to show us our Bordel scale, which is class 8 and 9. The scale goes from 1 to 9 with nine being the worst. So the lower the number, the better the skies. As we move our way out of the center of Chicago, maybe into these purple areas, you'll see the class, the border class drop down to seven. We get into the reds and we're in class five. The yellows and greens will get us into a four. And if we back out here and go west a little bit in these gray areas, you'll see these are class two. And then the dark gray areas are the ones that we all want to shoot in. That's class one. There is zero light pollution in these areas. Um, so that's just a quick primer. That's what the Bortle scale is when you hear people talk about it. If you want to determine your border class where you live or where you're going to be shooting, just hit up this website and it'll show you what you need to know. So with that being said, let's jump into Cyril now. I have my image already pre-processed, registered, and stacked of the Pac-Man Nebula NGC 281. And we're just going to jump over the RGB tab. I'm going to come down here and take my view out of linear and go into auto stretch. Shot this with my Canon M50 mirrorless. The gradient isn't too bad in this image. The first thing you want to do before you do any background extraction is you want to make sure you get rid of your artifacts around the edges here from stacking. I've talked about this in my beginner's tutorial before, but it's important because of the samples that we're going to be putting down on this image for background extraction land on those artifacts, it, you'll get weird results. So you always want to make sure you start with your crop. You need to be on your red, green, or blue channel to do that. Got my little crosshairs going here, and I'm gonna do a pretty heavy crop on this one because it's a small object. And I can see some stacking artifacts that reach pretty deep into the image. So let's draw a box around it, right click, and crop. So now, back on RGB, again, you can see how it's brighter on this side and it kinda, all the way across this diagonal, down in this corner. Up in here, it's a little bit darker. To help see things a little bit better, you can come down to this little star button with the blue background and this will give you a false color on your image and sometimes that'll make those gradients easier to see so when you're placing your samples down you have a better representation of where those samples should be um, again this one isn't too bad it's right there we're gonna go back to normal color though because that's blinding my eyes right now and before we open up the background extraction we're gonna jump over to one of our color channels here you can't work in the RGB layer if you do try to work while you're on the RGB layer and you click on the screen you'll get this message that it's only for visualization so red green or blue it's your choice I'm gonna work on the blue now because we can see most of the gradient on that channel it's easier to see on that channel so we'll go up to image processing and background extraction and we have two interpolation methods that we're gonna go over today, RBF and polynomial. Before we start talking about those two, I want to go over the settings, starting with samples per line all the way down because all these will apply to either one of the interpolation methods that you select. So samples per line, currently it's set at 20 and grid tolerance is set at two. So the easiest way to explain that is just to show you. If I click the generate button, it automatically places sample points on my image for me. The 20 samples per line means from left 
to right, it'll place 20 samples. If I was to bump that number up to say 40 and hit generate, I'll get 40 samples per line left to right across the image. 40 is way too much for what we're doing today, so I'm going to put that back to 20. Your grid tolerance is how aggressive it will be in, a, in placing the sample. So you'll notice around the nebula, it didn't place any directly on the nebula, which is what we want. But because of the gradient that we have going on, it left that alone because it's more than likely thinks that that's part of the image, not part of the background. So when this happens, when it's missing parts of your background, you can do one of two things. You can play with the grid tolerance and bump that up. I'm going to take this up to four and then hit generate again. And that way it filled in that corner. But then it also started to kind of creep in in our nebula here. The other way to do it, if we go back to two and hit generate, we can manually place our sample points. So just left mouse click down in the, in the areas that it missed. You can fill these in yourself just like this. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to four and hit generate. And then around the nebula where it's getting too close, if I just right click on any of these samples, it'll take them away. So we're just going to clean up around the Pac-Man nebula to keep them off of our DSO object. So those, those are the first two settings, sample per line and grid tolerance. Add dither. I'll show you right now with this particular image, and this doesn't happen all the time, but sometimes it does, and it'll end up posterizing your image. When the, the dynamic of the image, sometimes it's, it's inefficient for the, the tool to actually be able to find a, a sample that's visually continuous across your image, you'll end up with some weird color banding. So I'm going to jump over the RGB before we do this. If I just click Compute Background right now and let it finish and do its thing, we well, can see in the background we have some color banding going on. Uh, jump over on the other channels and maybe you can see a more contrasted version of it. There's some dark areas that kind of just like swoops around the corners here. And look at the green, same thing. The red is pretty prominent in the red, so that's a good visualization of what I'm talking about. If your image looks like this after computing your background, it's just posterizing it. They had a hard time creating that synthetic background based on the samples that it took. Easiest way to fix that is your add dither option. It'll inject random noise when it's creating that synthetic background, when it's doing the background extraction for you. So if you watch the screen, I'll leave it on the red channel here because I think you guys could probably see that the best. And if I hit compute background again, this time it'll balance everything out without posturizing it. Okay, that's add dither. Our clear button simply will clear all of our samples out for us. Our correction type, you have two to choose from. There's subtraction and division. Subtraction, probably 99% of the time, that's what you're going to be using. The times that you would use division are if you're noticing that you're having problems with vignetting, stuff that you expect your flat images should have taken care of, but they didn't. Sometimes if you run this with division, it'll take that stuff out. It'll help correct the image where your flats failed on you. Um, again, subtraction is where you're going to be using it most of the time, so we'll leave that on subtraction. The show original button. This one's kind of weird. It makes sense. You think if you click on show original image, it would go back and revert to the original image, and you would be right. But if you hover your mouse, like I'm doing now, it says keep pressing this button to see the original message. And they mean that literally. The only way I got this to work, I was clicking one at a time at first, giving it a couple seconds in between, and nothing was happening. What I found is if you rapidly click your mouse button four or five times, it looks like the program kind of hung for a second, but if you just give it a few seconds, it does revert back. So that'll revert you back, or you can simply just close background extraction and it'll revert back that way as well. Apply to sequence and the output prefix. Uh, really, at this point, uh, as, as a beginner, and you're using the script that I've shown in my beginner's tutorial, the OSC preprocessing script, this does all the heavy lifting for you as far as preprocessing and registering and stacking are concerned. But when the day comes, and it will come as you move through the hobby and, and you want to start taking better control of, of, the, of your data, you'll probably start looking at wanting to um, do what the script is doing, but doing it manually. And that's where these tabs would come in. At that point in time we're not going to dive deep into this but what apply to sequence means is you can have a sequence 
actually here let me show you real quick if I open up my process directory this is what the, this is all the sequences and the fit files that the script created and I come to sequence and do a search sequence and I'll just grab my PP light one so now I have a single frame being displayed in this sequence and if I click my open frame list, it shows me all of the files, all of the images that are within that sequence. And if you're curious how this works, check out my comment stacking videos uh, because we did go through this. We did do the comment stacking ones in part manually using sequences and stuff. So what that means, if you keep this in mind, this sequence list of files, what that means is, is when you're in background extraction and you set your interpolation method and your samples, you get everything the way you like it and you hit compute background before clicking apply we would tick apply to sequence now when i hit apply it'll go through that pp light sequence and every single file that we've seen in our frame list will have this background extraction applied to it so why would you use that well if you had a very strong complex gradient that after stacking you're having a hard time removing this could be an option you could go through and remove the gradient from each individual light frame before it was stacked and then once that final stack was complete that gradient would still still exist but it may not be as complex and may be easier to remove at that point because we went through and did a background extraction on each file so i'll probably do a video sometime in the future showing how to do things manually but for now you don't need to worry about apply to sequence uh, the output prefix that goes hand in hand with the apply to sequence option that will prefix the name of our sequence with bkg underscore as well as all the fit files within it so again you don't need to worry about those two right now that's more of an intermediate function of the tool so let's get back to talking about our two interpolation methods now that you understand all the settings below them so i'm going to go back and open up our fit file because we're in that sequence for that little explanation i just gave you so I'm gonna open up my result.fit file. We're in auto stretch and I'll give it another crop real quick. Come back over to our console so we can watch what's going on. So again, image processing, background extraction. It defaults to RBF. I'm gonna back up and I'm gonna select polynomial. You have four options, one, two, three, or four. These numbers, the worse your gradient, the worse that you think your gradient is, the higher the number you should select. So if I was to start with number one right here, knowing that my gradient mostly is right down here, so this is a pretty simple gradient. Um, we're gonna need to go higher than one for this, but we'll start with one. We're gonna hit generate, let it place our samples, right click around our DSO. We're gonna make sure our correction is set to subtraction and hit compute background may be hard for you guys to see on the video but the, the gradient still exists down here it's, it's done a good job over and around these areas but i can still see some brightness coming around the corners here so i am simply going to bump it up i know three does me good on this so i'm going to set the degree order to three and hit compute background again that cleaned us up nicely so even though you understand now what each of these settings do right the lower the number the less the gradient the higher the number the worse the gradient that you have you still need to play with everything, right? Every set of data is going to be different. It may get to a point if you're shooting with the same equipment all the time, the, the same location, that when you look at your images, you'll get to the point where you'll look at your gradient and say, yeah, that looks like I'm going to, I'm going to need to run that at a four, or I can probably get away with doing a one. Either way, play with it, see what works. Right now in this step, as we're going through, every time I change my degree order, and hit compute background this is non-destructive it's just working on the image as it's displaying it to us nothing gets applied until i tell it to by clicking the apply button so you can go back and forth as many times as you want you can change your samples per line your grid tolerance add or remove dither any of these settings can be changed and hit compute background again once you're happy with the result then you click apply and it's applied all right so that's polynomial we're going to roll back by hitting our left arrow up here and go back into background extraction. And this time we're going to use the RBF. RBF stands for Radial Basis Function. 
Both of these interpolation methods are actually mathematical equations. I'm not going to pretend like I know what they are and I understand them. If you want to look them up and or if you're a math type person and you already know what they mean, great. But so for the purpose of this tutorial, I'm not going to tr even try to turn this into a mathematical tutorial. So the only thing that changes, if you notice, is this option right here says smoothing, right? If we go back to the other one, we have degree order and RBF has smoothing. Everything else stays the same. That's why we went through that stuff first. The first thing is RBF is what Cyril recommends that we use moving forward from version 1.0.2 is when they introduced the, the radial basis function. You can still use the polynomial. It's just this one will work. Generally, will do a better job for you. And the smoothing option simply means how aggressively it's going to lower your gradients in your image. So you can go, the default is 0.5. You can go from zero all the way up to one. And again, this is something that you're just gonna have to play with to see what you get the best results for. Uh, most of the time, 0.5 works pretty well for me, but there there can be issues when this will over or undershoot, be too aggressive or not aggressive enough. Again, just play with it. It doesn't do anything to the image until you click apply. So to give you an example of that, I am gonna put this all the way over to zero. And I'm just gonna use the auto generate for the samples. We'll clean up around our nebula here and then hit compute background. And with it set at zero for the smoothing, you can see some of these dark spots here. It's really over processing it or missing parts of what it thinks should be the background. If I come back and set this back to 0.50 and hit compute background again, It does a lot better job of figuring out what that background is and creating a synthetic background for us. So in this case, like I said, 0.5 again, worked out well for me for this image. So 0.5 works all the way up to one actually. I mean, you, if you look closely, and I know you're not gonna be able to see this, but there, there's minor improvements with a little bit higher of a number. You know, the changes between 0.5 and 1 for me with this particular set of data are very, very minor. I am, I'd be hard pressed to actually even see the difference. So I would work up on most images. I would start at the 0.5. If I started seeing those dark areas like we did with the zero, then I'd start working myself up a little bit more towards the, the one. Keep in mind that if you have really large gradients, going this high going closer to the one is probably not going to fix anything and i would start working my way towards the lower side of this scale so we're on 0.5 let me compute the background one more time just to make sure we are sitting where we want to be all right so i'm going to clear my samples so one of the nice things about the rbf interpolation method is it doesn't require a lot of samples it's actually recommended that you place your samples yourself so if we go back let's undo all of this so if i go back instead of worrying about my samples per line and my grid tolerance and then hitting generate i'm still going to leave dither on because because I know I have an issue with posterization on this image, but I'm just gonna come in and place my samples manually. And I generally like to do that around the edges, making sure that I get the corners first. And you don't need to put a lot. When you're placing these, just like always, I've mentioned this in previous videos, you don't wanna put them on any large or bright stars. Obviously, you don't wanna put them on your nebula or your galaxy, but just come around and as you're selecting them, try to stay off the stars the best as possible. And like I said, you don't need a lot, but I like to get all the way around the edge, so it, that's usually where most of the gradients start. Work my way in, just finding the darker areas of the image. And you know, just like a lot of things, right? The automated features are really cool but when you can get in here and you can do this stuff manually yourself and you can specify in this case what the background is a lot of the times you end up with a better result it takes more time sure but you know it's part of the fun it's part of the artistic side of this whole hobby um so and if you're unsure when you're placing your samples if you've hit a star or not you can Hold your control key down and it'll zoom wherever your mouse is at just by rolling your mouse wheel back and forth. And then if you get out of whack and you need to zoom back out again, you can just come down here to your zoom to fit button, fit the image, the window button, and it'll put you back where you started. So I've got my sample set 
and I think that's going to be okay. I've got maybe, what, 15, 20 sit up, sitting here. I'm just going to hit Compute Background and see what we get. And that, that looks really good. I mean, that is a nice, smooth background. Look at it on RGB. Our green channel, our red channel. So that looks really good. So, you know, again, that's kind of the recommended way of doing it. Not that you can't use the generate and, and have it put the samples in place for you automatically. That's fine. But this, this is probably the best practice way, I would say. I don't have to check every single sample that the generate placed down to make sure it didn't hit a star. Everything's where I want it to be. So one more thing I wanted to show you guys. Um, everybody always says, myself included, when you're placing your samples, whether it's manually or automatically, make sure they're not on your DSO make sure they're not on a star. I wanna show you what happens if you place them on a star. So we're gonna come over here and pick on this one right here. If I was to put a sample right on that star and then hit compute background, just watch this area right here and I'll show you what happens. Pretty obvious, right? It thought that star was part of the background so it tried to incorporate that star, its brightness and color and everything as part of the synthetic background. So the point with that is is if you're laying samples down, whether you're doing it manually or you're generating them automatically and you hit compute background and you see something like this, you see a black spot come up and look at it over here in the color. See, it's more of a red over here and you're scratching your head saying, what the heck is that? Where did that come from? There's a good chance you landed on a star with one of your sample points. So you just come back over, you know, look closely in that area at all the sample points right click and remove it hit compute background again and we'll be back to our original synthetic background that we had so at that point i'm happy i'm going to hit apply and continue the processing with the rest of this image that's it for background extraction um, hope you guys found it useful just want to give everybody an understanding it's one thing to know which buttons to click and play with but if you understand exactly what they're doing it helps the processing i feel so that's why i wanted to put this video together today um, so if you found it helpful give the video a like have any questions or suggestions just like always leave them in the comments below i'm gonna finish my processing on this image appreciate everybody's time and clear skies <laughs>